If you have your Bibles, um, we're going to be in a lot of different places. We're going to start in actually in Acts 13. We'll look at one verse there and kind of leap from there. Uh, but this morning, we're going to actually conclude a series that we've been in for the last few weeks. And the series is this concept of called discovering your purpose in life. And so uh, what we've been talking about is this reality that, that in the church, many times, we use the word called to describe an exclusive group of people that God has spoken to about their lives. That means that they're going to be called to do some kind of ministry. But the rest of us, somehow we're left on the sidelines, not called at all. That you can't find that anywhere in the Bible. If you are a follower of Jesus, you are called. And that means because of that, that means God has created you and designed you and purposed you in this life to accomplish things that he had in advance for you to do. And so that means that in the church, in the game called the kingdom of God, there are no benches to sit on. There's only a field or a court to play on. And that means that we're all in. That means discovering what does it look like for me to fully live out my purpose in life that God has given to me. And so the last few weeks, in fact, if you, you picked up, there was a theme in worship today. Anybody kind of know what it was? That maybe the fact that God actually does love us. And so, which is so powerful because out of his love for us, he shaped us and he's formed us. But if you weren't here a couple weeks ago, just kind of backtrack, we started with this reality. How do you discover what your life's about? Well, you have to begin with understanding who you belong to. You don't belong to yourself. You don't belong to other people. You belong to God because he's the one that's created you. Last week, we talked about when you understand who you belong to, you can understand who you are. What does it mean to be who you are, to, be your, to understand your identity, to live that out? Which leads to the, really the question that has driven this entire series, which is this. What am I supposed to do with my life? Anybody ever thought or asked that question? Please raise your hand, because if you're human, you've done that once or twice, or a thousand times. And it isn't just like, again, this series is not built for some young 20-something that's now just branching out of college and trying to head into some new season of life. At every season of our life, we ask the same question. God, what am I supposed to be doing with my life? What did you call me to do? Because God will shape your calling according to into the seasons of your life that will address the different things that he's wanting you to do in those times and seasons. So if you're retired, God has still called you. The call ends when you see Jesus someday in heaven. That's when the call ends. But until then, we all have a purpose that God is wanting us to fulfill. And so today we're going to talk about this. But as I've said this in, in this, this series, all of us wish that there was a formula that if we could just plug in all the data of our life into the formula, then we'd come up with the perfect answer of what we're supposed to do with our life. Don't you wish it was that easy? It isn't, but I'm going to give you just kind of before we jump into what we're going to look at today, something that's very practical that is actually designed for this purpose. Catalyst, which many of you have gone through and some of you are going through right now. The next cohort, by the way, will not st start, start till the fall, but I want you to understand. Catalyst is designed to help you discover who Jesus is in a way of having a relationship in intimacy with him and discover who you are and how God has formed and shaped you so that you know how to live the life that he's called you to live. It's not just 24 weeks of like, oh man, 24 weeks is a long time. No, when you come out of that, you should have a deeper practice in life that connects you to Jesus and a clarity of who you are that now you know what you're, what you're wired and, and geared and designed to do in life, so now you can go do that. I wanted just to say that because sometimes people are like, what is Catalyst? It's just a class. It's a Bible study. It's not a class. It's not a Bible study. It's a journey that's supposed to set you up to help you learn to follow Jesus, to know yourself, and then live out his purpose and mission in the world. That's what it's about. I'm not saying, oh, that's a nice plug for Catalyst, Pastor John. No, I want you to understand. Here's a practical way. You don't know who you are. You don't know what you're called to do. Go through Catalyst. Hopefully, we'll give you some clarity in what God is doing in your life. So with that said this morning, we're, we're going to talk about this idea of what am I supposed to do with my life? But what we're going to dial down into is this really important idea. What we do in following Jesus is always shaped by who we are. You cannot separate those two things. If you separate what you do with who you are, you lose the whole reality of what God designed you to do. God doesn't make you a hammer and, make, and then ask you to saw a piece of wood. It doesn't work that way. Your design is made up for what he wants in life. And so because of that, this morning we're going to look at, I'm going to use the example of David. Because David's life gives us a great example of what it looks like when you finally understand who you are, it determines what you do in life. And before we look at the passage of scripture we're going to look at, and then some other passages, would you just pause with me as we've been doing? And we want to pray because we're convinced when we read God's word and we listen to it, that God's spirit is active and alive and working in us and wants to speak to us this morning. Amen? So let's pray. Lord Jesus.
we thank you that when we, we look into the scriptures, we not, we're not just looking at men's wisdom or women's wisdom or some great philosophy. We are listening to your very words. And so, Lord, as we read your word and, and digest what it means for us today, would your spirit speak to us and would you give us the courage to live out in obedience what you're calling us to do and who we are supposed to be in this world. We thank you that you are here to actively work in our lives today. In your name, amen. So it'll be on the screen, but I want to start with this verse that describes David's life. In verse 36 of Acts 13, it says this. When David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. He was buried with his ancestors. So obviously fell asleep means that he passed away. So why don't you just let that verse settle in. Wouldn't you love someday, when you die, that that verse was written about your life? That when you got to the end of your life, it could be said of you that you fulfilled the very purpose that God brought you into the world to fulfill, and so you can rest in peace. I would. That would be about the best thing you could ever say in my life. Not accomplishments, not a list of all the things I did in my life, but ultimately I did what God created me to do and fulfilled his purpose in my life. That is the greatest accomplishment. So when we read that, that passage, what does this tell us about David and what does it tell us about ourselves? So four things that are David's example to us about how he lived out God's purpose in his own generation. And this is really important because it's tied to understanding who he is because who he is describes what he does effectively. So four things I want to touch on. First of all, this, you're going to see a theme. David fought as a shepherd. So this is really important. David had an identity, he had a calling in his life. And we'll talk about this. His context may have changed, his identity and his calling never does. It's the same thing for us. So in 1 Samuel 17, if you're not familiar, you know David actually, one of the most famous stories in the Bible is the story of David and Goliath. And when David shows up on the battlefield before he engages with Goliath, we have Israel who's at its standstill and not doing anything. And finally, this shepherd, which is what he was, he was a young shepherd, shows up and says, why aren't we engaging the enemy? Why are we standing here letting Goliath mock the armies of the living God? And so he steps forward. And what is Saul's first default in David engaging in battle? He looks at this scrawny little kid, and he thinks, this kid is going to get slaughtered by Goliath. The least I can do is make him a soldier. So he takes, Saul takes his own armor, and he puts it on David. And can you imagine what that looked like? Saul's, Saul's armor is probably way too big for him. He's tripping over himself. So he, it's worse. And so David finally says, like, this is not me. And so what does David do? This is what's insane. He goes out on a battlefield facing this guy who most likely is about nine feet tall, probably weighs 600 pounds, and is a fierce warrior and has probably killed hundreds of men with his own bare hands. And he goes out with what? A slingshot and some stones. Can you imagine Israel like, oh, now we're really sunk. <laughs> and if you don't know the story, most of us know the story. He takes his slingshot, he throws the stone, and boom, he takes Goliath down. If David goes out there as a soldier like Saul wanted him to do, what happens? He gets defeated and the entire Israel's army is going to get slaughtered. But he goes out what? As a soldier. Can you imagine what kind of pressure David felt when he shows up on a battlefield and everybody is in their armor and they have their swords and they have their shields and they're ready to go and he walks out there with no armor and just a slingshot and stones. Why? Because that's the weapon of a shepherd. This is important. You walk into life and you think, okay, this is what's required of me. And so you try to become something that you're not in a context. And you now find yourself losing the battle. Because God didn't call you to sh fit into what the context is. He called you to be who you are. Which leads to the second thing. David also ruled as a shepherd. So we also call him King David because he became king. Listen to what it says in Psalm 78, uh, verse 72. It says, God presented David to his people as their shepherd, and he cared for them with a true heart and skillful hands. So now David becomes a king, but what is he still? He's still a shepherd. See, because you have to understand, a called shepherd beats an armored soldier, or armed soldier every time. A called shepherd makes a better leader than a qualified king every time. Why? Because the role of a king, and this is what we have to understand, not an earthly king, but the heavenly king is what? Is to be a good shepherd. That's what a king's supposed to do. So when David was at his best, what was he doing? He was caring for his people. Why? Because although his context was to be king, his vocation, what was he doing? He was shepherding people. 
didn't change who he was. Then you get to the third thing that's true of him, and, and that's this, David also cared as a shepherd. So he's leading his people, but in, in 2 uh, Samuel chapter 9, this is amazing, compa- compassionate thing does. So remember, so later in Saul's life, Saul becomes the, the rival and enemy to David because he's threatened by David, and eventually David becomes king, Saul dies, and most all of the, Saul's family has, has died off except for one of his grandsons, Mephibosheth. And so David hunts down the last member of Saul's family, and you're thinking, why? He's going to slaughter him finally. David didn't do that. What did he do? He takes Saul's grandson, and as a shepherd, he welcomes him into his own house. Can you imagine taking the, the, the grandchild of your, your rival, your enemy, and saying, hey, come live with me. Come be a son in my household. What is that? That's the heart of a shepherd that sees a sheep that is lost and brings him into the fold. That's what David was doing. So you understand, so David has got this idea that although he's, his role changes, he's still who he is. He's still that little kid who went out on the battlefield to defeat Goliath as a shepherd. He's still the little kid who was out in the pastures in the wilderness fighting off the lion and the bear and protecting his flock. He's still that same guy. Why? Because that's how God created him to be. No matter the context, he's still the shepherd. But here's of the fourth thing, here's where David missed it. And this is why it's so important for us to understand, what do I do with my life? It's shaped by who you are. So here it is, David failed as what? A king. He never failed as a shepherd, but he failed as a king. Why? How do we know this? 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. It says, in the spring of the, the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him, all of Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David did what? He remained at Jerusalem. What does a, g- a good king do? He goes to war with his army. <laughs> but what is, what is David doing here? He's acting like an entitled king. I don't have to fight battles anymore. I've had a lot of victories. I've, I've shed a lot of blood, but now it's my time to rest. And I'm gonna let, let, let the army go out and do its thing, so I'm gonna stay back. See, that's what a king does. See, and that's, by the way, in the Old Testament, God, re- God warned his people over and over and over again, I'm your king, you don't want an earthly king, because eventually an earthly king will just use you for their benefit. That's what David's doing. And if you don't know the story as it unfolds, what happens with David when he doesn't go out to battle? He sees Bathsheba on a, on a rooftop, which, by the way, no accident. He knows where she is. He lusts after her. He goes, sends one of his servants to get her. He sleeps with her. He gets her pregnant, and that's not bad enough. He pulls her husband, Uriah, off the front lines, one of his best warriors, brings him home, gets him drunk, tries to get him to sleep with his wife, can't do it because Uriah's an upstanding guy, and then sends Uriah back into the battlefield, pulls back the army, and lets him get slaughtered. He becomes an adulterer and a murderer. Why? because he was acting like an entitled king. He had forgotten he was never supposed to be an entitled king. He was supposed to be what? A shepherd. And a shepherd cares for people no matter what the context is. And so that's, that's a warning to you and I because a called shepherd is always better than an entitled king. David is the example for us because all of us There's something that God wants to say to you about who you are. And part of the journey is understanding that we talked about this. You are a child of God first and foremost. You are a son and a daughter of the king. But out of that, God gives you specific things. And that's why even in the journey of Catalyst, we do this thing called an identity exchange that we picked up from the True Identity series we did a couple years ago that gives you a way to listen to God speak to you about who you uniquely are. Because there are things God wants to say to you, but you haven't heard it because you've bought into the lies about what the enemy has said who you are. And so you don't even know. You couldn't say, I don't know if I'm a shepherd or what I'm supposed to be because you haven't been able to hear from the Lord. But when you finally discover that, you discover that there's some things that God's gonna call you to do that he's calling you there because he knows who you are, he knows what you've, you, why you do, and the context is gonna change, but you're never gonna change. And that's why your purpose in life doesn't change. Your context does, your vocation does, but your calling never changes. It's who you are. It's who God has called you to be. So out of that, three things that I wanna dial down again, using David as the example. So how do you and I live out God's purpose in our life? How do we do that? First of all is this. Remember, calling doesn't change, but context does. So your job, you may have five different jobs in your life, but it doesn't change who you are. But if it does, then you're in trouble. (laughs) 
because you walked away from your calling. David's context went from what? From the pasture to the battlefield to the throne. That's his context. But what was David supposed to be? A shepherd in every context. Who are you supposed to be in every context? Do you know who you're supposed to be in every context? Do you know enough about yourself? Do you know enough about God yet to understand that? God wants you to, and that's the, the beauty of what we sang about today, about how deeply God loves you. It isn't a blanket saying, I love what Sonia did at the end and adjusted it. It's not that God loves all of us, that God loves me. Now, some of us, we feel uncomfortable. We're like, well, aren't we supposed to be like saying how great God is? Yeah, how great God is is the fact that the God of the universe loves you individually, knows you by name. Why do you think I believe that God spoke through Sonia when she called out the name Lori because God is that specific? And that's God's God specific with all of us. So he wants you to know who you are. So remember that your calling doesn't change, but your context does. And this is important to understand because that means whatever role you find yourself in, whatever thing you're doing in volunteering, whatever your thing you're doing in a job, it isn't about the job. It's about what you bring to the table and who you are. So I warned my wife who's gonna talk about her a little bit. I usually have to like warn my kids and my wife to say, hey, by the way, you're gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna try to embarrass you. But one of the things I love about my wife, Kim, is that most of you who know her, she is who she is no matter what context she's in. She always has been, as long as I've known her. Because she has a strong sense of who she is and what she's called to do. So she's had a number of different vocations in life, but every vocation, the same thing always rises to the surface. So I remember when, when, when we first got married, she was working at different jobs, but then when, when the kids were born, I remember she, she had taken a break and she went back to work and she became an executive assistant in the process right before they were born and then after and did some work for a guy who's multimillionaire, very successful businessman. But this is the thing I always knew about my wife. She's a counselor and she's an organizer and she's a compassionate person. No matter what context I've seen her in, those all rise to the surface. So she's working as an executive assistant for this multimillionaire, and here's what ends up happening. This guy who first has no respect for her because she's just an executive assistant, and he's a multimillionaire, over time starts to have respect, and before you know it, here's what's crazy. My wife, the executive assistant, is counseling the multimillionaire in his family, in his life. And guess what? She, this is years ago. She didn't work for him anymore, but guess who she still gets calls from once in a while? this very wealthy, now he's shifted careers and he's making even more money, but every once in a while he still reaches out to Kim White because she's counseling him. She's an organizer, so everything she touches, if there's chaos, she brings order. Everything she's ever done, as, a, as an office manager, people love, people, if you don't know my wife, everybody's like, you don't want Kim to come to your house and see your garage because she'll want to organize it. If you, don't want, if you don't want things purged from your life, then don't see Kim because it'll disappear and everything will be nice and organized and la labeled and you'll be able to find everything you have. But Kim was an office manager, and I watched the same thing happen. She's organizing people. She's not just organizing an office. She's organizing people's lives. And then before you know it, she's having lunch, lunch with an employee as an office manager, but not as an office manager, as a counselor. So she starts counseling all the employees in life. She can't help herself. Why? Because that's the way God's wired her. See, that's what God has for us. So it doesn't matter where you find yourself. Just be who you are. That's God's calling. That's God's purpose in your life. That's what David was supposed to do. And thank goodness for God's forgiveness that when he became a king and he blew it, God still forgave him and said, David, remember, you're a shepherd. Just be who you are. When does sin come in our life? When we try to be something we were never supposed to be. But when we are who we are and who God says we are and living out our purpose, that's when we are alive. Second thing, living out God's purpose in our life also means this. Remember, choosing vocation over calling will cost you. What do I mean by that? If you sell out for a job to make money or prestige or fame and lose who you are, you've missed God's purpose. And we live in a world where this is, this is the way that we live our lives. We sell out what? For fame, we sell out for the promotion. We sell out for money. Why? Because all those things we think are going to make us happy. Where is David's greatest failure? Is when he sold out to be a king. He did. He was supposed to be a shepherd. If he was a shepherd in that situation, he would have gone out to battle. Even if he maybe for some reason had a physical ailment and he couldn't go out to battle with the army, as a shepherd, what would he have done? If he saw Bathsheba, he wouldn't have stared the second time. He would have walked back into his palace covered his eyes and make sure that that woman was covered because she was not an object of his desire. She was one of the sheep of Israel that he was entrusted to care for. See, that's, that's what you and I have to understand. 
And so many times we, we feel a sense of calling, we feel a sense of purpose in life, we get into something that we know is what God's called us to do, but over time there's a slow fade and we begin to start taking on something different than who we are. So a few years ago in a church that I was on staff at, um, there was a worship leader who had written a couple songs. He was getting very popular. He's a very good, gifted Christian artist. And so he was starting to kind of travel around and, and lead worship at different churches. And so he was coming into Southern California, and we were the first stop on his tour. So I was, I was in charge of picking him up at the airport. And so I drove down one day and took him to the airport, pick him up. And, and his songs were amazing. People were singing his songs. And, and so I thought, what a privilege. I get to go pick this guy up at the airport. And so, so I met him, and uh, we got uh, all of his luggage, and he brought his keyboard with him. And so I had a small, like, two-door car. And so we're, like, creatively fitting everything in. And I could tell as we're trying to fit things in the car, he's kind of getting irritated, just kind of like, He's looking at my car, and he's looking at all his stuff, and you could tell without saying it, he was thinking, why didn't you bring a bigger car? Like, why didn't you bring, like, a van, like, for all my stuff? And so I'm like, so we kind of fit it in. It took us a while. We fit it in. And then we were driving from LAX back. We were up in Ventura at the time. So we were driving up to Ventura. We were having a conversation, and I could tell there was just this air of him. It's like he didn't want to have a real conversation with me. He, I was somehow like a peon that was, you know, entrusted to pick him up at the airport. And I was like, man, the, the guy's songs don't seem to indicate this is the kind of guy he is. And then I remember I helped, helped him check into the hotel, and I'm like literally like loading stuff out of the car, bringing it in, and he wouldn't touch any of it. It was all left up to me. And he gets to the counter, and then they tell him the room he's in, and he starts complaining immediately. He's just upset. He's just like, I don't know. I'm so exhausted. I've just did it. And he's going on and on. And I remember I got back in the car. And I'm like, I hope his attitude changes in the morning when he's supposed to lead wor worship at our, at our church. But he comes in. And he's setting up, and I'm watching him kind of belittle our sound guy, and he's just kind of like, he's the kind of guy that, you know, he, when worship starts, he comes up, and then when worship's over, he kind of disappears into, like, the green room, right? And I remember I walked away from that, and I thought, that was one of the most disappointing, actually, it was a little, almost like I was a little disillusioned with worship leaders, because I thought, this guy writes incredible songs about who Jesus is, and the church is singing his songs, and he's called to be a worship leader, but he thinks he's a Christian artist, that's entitled to some kind of certain level of care when he's in town. And I thought, you know what? I'll bet in his life he started out as a worship leader. He barely knew how to use, play the keyboard. He barely knew how to write songs, but somebody gave him a shot, and he finally stepped into what God called him to do, and he was good at it. But somewhere down the line, he got entitled, just like David did. And because of that, he believed his own press, when people patted on the back and said, man, you're an amazing worship leader, he started thinking himself as a Christian artist instead of someone who's there to point to Jesus. Now, I'm not going to tell you his name because you're like, who is it? Who is it? I gotta. Most of you probably wouldn't even know it is because I don't think he turned out very well after that. So I don't know. Maybe there was some connection. But, but I share that story because we're all susceptible to that. You start to figure out who you are, but you get into a place, and that's why I joke about this with people. Like, I don't really care if you like my message or not. I know it's a joke. Some people know me like, Pastor John, that was a great message. That's great. I don't care. <laughs> the reason why is that I'm not here for the pat on the back. I'm here so that God might speak through me through his words so that there might be some change and transformation in your life that gets you closer to Jesus. That's all that I'm here for. The moment I start saying, man, I need five people to tell me I had a great message today. Otherwise, I'm going to fall apart. <laughs> what happens? I become entitled. So what do you do for a living? What's your vocation? Do you need people to say, man, you're the best at this? They should say you're the best at it, but you shouldn't need that. Why? Because then you become entitled, and when you become entitled, you forget who you are. David forgot who he was. God doesn't want us to forget who we are. Isn't it interesting in our culture when you meet, we meet people many times, one of the first questions is, what do you do for a living? And you know how we respond? I am. It's an identity. I am what? I am a doctor. I'm a lawyer. Uh, I am an executive. I'm in finance. I am. No, that's what you do. It's not who you are. That's your vocation. And that's the thing we have to keep separated because we ultimately, if we, if we choose our vocation over our calling, we will lose a sense of God's purpose in our life. And then finally, this is important to remember. Remember your calling and your vocation are not the same thing. Now, you think, well, these are just kind of semantics. You're kind of saying the same thing. No, 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 no. This is really important. This is why in the church so many times, well, oh, those people are called. They're called to be in ministry. So that means they're going to go to a church, they're going to work on a staff, they're going to be in ministry. Did you know, realize that we're all called to ministry? But here's the reality. There are times in your life where your calling and your voca vocation are going to be the same lane. 
You're going to run in the same lane. They're going to match up. There are going to be other times in your life where your calling and your vocation are not the same thing. But here's the thing. What, what do you do when that happens? You're like, man, I, I, I don't want to be in this job, but I'm in this job for right now, and it's not really who I am, so, so how do I navigate this? Focus more on how you do what you do than what you do. See, because the point is, is that David was what? He was a shepherd in the field. He was a shepherd on the battlefield, and he was supposed to be a shepherd as a king, but he focused on what? He focused on his context. He focused on his vocation, and he lost his calling. So that means whatever you do, if you know who you are, you do it according to who you are. And that's why God is, makes you unique. And that's one of the, that's one of the reasons when, when people look at followers of Jesus, whether they are a janitor or they are a CEO of a company, they should look at you and see something different. Why? Because they look at more of how you do what you do than what you do. That's a, that's a person who's called. That's a person who lives with purpose. That they, they have this ability to do something that makes their job better, not because they're trying to fit into the job, but because they're being who they are. So I have a, a friend, and that's obviously how, how David did that in his life. But, you know, Paul in the New Testament similarly says this. Paul had a vocation. It was tent making, but he had a calling, which was apostle. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. That's who he's supposed to be. And so that's what he lived out in his life. Why is this important? Because there are going to be jobs and vocations that you have that you don't feel passionate about, that you don't love, that you don't want to be in, but it's where you are right now. And it may require that you change jobs, but you may not be able to do that. So you're like, okay, what am I doing? I'm stuck. No, you're not stuck. You can still be who you are, even though it's not lining up with what you do. So I have a friend of mine who... This is him, and this is really interesting. He was a very gifted airline uh, or aircraft mechanic, and he did it for a number of years. So much so that when he was working for Cessna, he kept getting promoted. He didn't want to, he didn't feel called to be an airline mechanic. He just was good mechanically. So he did his job really, really well. But one of the things that's true about his life is he cared deeply for people. And so even if he's working on a plane, he's still engaging with people, and he's still caring for people, and especially for people who don't know Jesus. Saw it in his personal life all the time. But he kept getting these promotions with Cessna. And before you know it, he went from working on planes to being a supervisor, from being a supervisor to being a regional maintenance coordinator for Cessna, all on kind of the, the west side of the United States. So he's now traveling to all these places, and he's working with high-end clients and all their planes. He's answering all these calls. And I'm watching him get frustrated with his job, but I'm also watching at the same time. The reason he's getting his promotions is because of the way he cares for people. You can see it because it isn't that he knows the inside and outside of a plane engine, which is great, he does, but when he engages with a client, he genuinely cares about the client. And so he's getting these rave, rave reviews about the clients he's working with because he cares about people. And so finally, it reached a tipping point for him. He was doing that for at least 10 years. And finally, I watched him reach the tipping point where it's like, I can't do this anymore because it's not allowing me to get to what I really want to do. And meanwhile, I was watching him blow up in our city, reaching people who don't know Jesus, welcoming people literally off the street into his home. He just had a deep compassion for people. And then he got this idea that he cared about people who didn't speak a language he spoke, who lived in other countries who didn't have access to Jesus. And so in a moment, he said, it's time to quit Cessna. He quit at the top of his field so he could do what? He could be a missionary. Because he thought, I finally, and then he had a season where his calling and his vocation were in the same lane. It wasn't that everything turned out perfect, going on the mission field, selling everything you have, taking your three young kids and your wife, that is difficult. They sold everything and they went for it. But I watched him care for people over and over and over again. Now he's no longer, he's not, a, he's not a vocational missionary right now, but he still loves people. I think he found his way back into the air, aircraft industry, but he still loves people. And that is so important that I watched him never confuse the two, but he did realize there was a tipping point in his life where what he was doing in his vocation was now actually fully limiting what he wanted to do with his calling. So why do I share that? You may be here today, and God may be prompting you to say, you know what? You've been doing what you've been doing for a long time, but you've reached your limit. Yeah, the money's good, the fame's good, the notoriety's good, that's great, but there may be something that he's calling you to saying, listen, now's the time in your life where vocation and calling should match. Others, it's not. So what do you focus on? You focus on how you do what you do. And if we do that, can you imagine what your life would feel like and be like if no matter what you did for a living, you still were who you are? You didn't have to sell your soul to a job in order to earn a paycheck? but you actually got to live out who you are?
That's the way God's designed us. In fact, I want to use this example as we head towards close. Most of us know the great artist Michelangelo. He has a couple of quotes that have been credited to him. And, and the first one is this. He's, he's, uh, he was asked about his, his masterpiece, David, who he actually sculpted it out of stone. And he said this. They're like, how did you do that? He said, I just chipped away the stone that doesn't, doesn't look like David. Now, some people say, he didn't really say that. I don't know. It's a great quote, though. But I want you to think about that. This is the very thing that God does for us. God's given you an identity. And the world, the, the life that we live, starts putting stuff on us that's not who we are. And God comes, starts chipping away. Second quote, he says this, every block of stone has a statue inside it, and it is the task of the sculptor to discover it. See, what does sin do? It puts identities on us. It puts expectations. It puts, puts things on us that we're never supposed to be a bar, part of who we are. Those are come in the form of the lies of the enemy. We buy into it, we believe it, and that God comes along through Jesus and the cross. Jesus dies for our sin. What does forgiveness do? It starts chipping away at all the broken pieces of our life until what is left? It's you. And that's part of what this life is, is God, God created you to be who you are, and sin messed the whole thing up. Our sin, the world's sin, everything just kind of got messed up. And God, what, as we sang earlier, God loved us so much. The most famous verse in the entire Bible, right? John 3, 16. That he sent his son into the world. That whoever believes in him won't perish, but will not have, when it says everlasting or eternal life, it's a capacity of life. It's not a length of life, which means if we don't have that in this world, we don't have life in this world. And God says, it's time for you to be alive. It's time for you to be who I created you to be. So I'm going to come along and I'm going to start chipping stuff off of you. So eventually what is left is who I originally created, not what you become. So I'm going to ask you if you would, these next few moments, I'm going to ask you just to close your eyes because as we conclude today and, and then even conclude this series that we've been in, I want you to reflect on maybe a picture, maybe a dream that God wants to give you that eventually will translate into the steps that you need to take, take from here moving forward. So I want you to picture three things. The first one is this. Just in your own mind, what would your life look like if you actually knew who you are? If you knew what you were called to do and to be, if you knew God's purpose in your life, just, just for a moment, I want just to pause. I just want you to think, what would that look like? Would it look different than it does right now? Would it change what you're doing in your life right now? Would it change the jobs you might be considering? Would it change the direction that your life is headed in right now? But on the positive note, what, what would that look like? God wants you to know who you are. He wants you to have a clear understanding of who he is and who, how he's created you and who he's created you to be. Second thing I want you just to, to think is this. What would your life look like if your meaning in life was not determined by your context, but it was defined by your calling? So I don't know what career or job you're in right now, but I, I want you to think about what would your life look like if the definition of your life was not tied to your vocation? but it's actually tied to something greater. How much more meaningful would your life be if your identity was not wrapped up in your vocation? Think about that for a moment. How free would you be to be somebody who's identified not by what they do, but above what they do, by something greater? Your employer does not give you an identity because God has already given you. And he has called you to live into that, regardless of what you do in your career or your vocation. Finally, I just want you to think about this. What would your life look like if you were driven 
with passion by your calling instead of obligation to your vocation. Man, what would that feel like to get up every single day and even though you may have a job that you don't appreciate or really like, you get up every single day because you are driven by this reality. God has called me to be this. And so today, this is who I am and this is who I'm going to be. Regardless of what my job will require of me today, today I will be this person because that's who I am and that's how I'm designed and that's what God has purposed for my life. What would that feel like to get out of bed every morning and have a passion for what you're about to do throughout the day? I want you to let those things settle in. Because what I've just described is the life God wants you to live. God didn't bring you into the world to work a job that you hated, to make enough money to get by, or even enough money to be comfortable, to earn your way to a retirement that either you squeak by in or you live lavishly in, to die someday and stand before him and say, there it is. That's what you gave your life for. There's more. There's more. What if somebody came to you and asked you what you did for a living and you came back and said, hey, you know what? I think there's a better question than that. Do you want to know who I am? I can tell you all day about what I do, but that's not who I am. If you really want to know who, who I am, I'll tell you. What if our lives were like that? I'm convinced that's what God has for us. And so in a moment, I'm going to pray and we'll close, but I don't want anyone to miss this because when I, I know when I felt this series a number of months ago, I felt like this is for our entire church. This is for every season of life. This isn't someone who's at the beginning or the middle of their career or even just a few years left before retirement. This is for everyone, including those in the room who are either there or close or maybe a few years in into retirement. Your context doesn't determine who you are. You never retire from your calling. You never rest from your identity. In fact, retirement may be the very moment where what you do and who you are can finally match up. And God has left you a light with a life that there's, you got, you got stuff left in the tank. God doesn't call you to go to a season where you get to just do nothing. That's called heaven. And we're not there yet. <laughs> And so those who have time and those who have resource and those who are physically able, God still has a call in your life. God still has purpose for you. In fact, it may be the most fruitful time of his purpose in your life ever in your years of being retired. Those of you at the beginning, I know I've talked with many young adults and the anxiety level of what in the world am I supposed to do with my life is so high. Here's the good news. God wants you to know who you are before you even know what you're going to do. So I'm going to encourage you, dive deep into Jesus. You can go to school, you can go to college, you can go through career counseling, you can do all those things, but if you don't dive into Jesus, it won't matter. That's why Jesus said, what is it, prophet? person if they gain the whole world and what yet they lose their very soul know Jesus and let Jesus guide your steps let him give you clarity on your calling and purpose and then run run the race he has for you live the life he's called you to live take the jobs you're supposed to take but never forget who you are and never forget what God has called you to do in this life Jesus, we thank you that you are a God who is not generic. You are a God who is specific. And Lord, I know it is cliche, but I know it is true. The moment where you hung on the cross for our sin and our brokenness and our failure and all the things that became attached to us that are not who we are and not who you created us are, when you hung on the cross because you were not only a man, you were God, I know you had the capacity to know every single person's name 
whom you were giving your life for. You knew that because you died not just collectively for the sins of the world, you died specifically for each individual human being. And so today, Lord, we are grateful. You died for me. You died for John. You died for Lori. You died for Wally. You died for Kim. You died for Daniel. You died for Liam. You died for all of us because you have a greater purpose in our lives. And so, Lord, I pray today we would discover that. Would you, through your miraculous forgiveness, would you just peel off all the broken layers that have come a part of us and all the lies that we believe, would you dispel with your truth so that we see ourselves and we see you clearly and the result is we finally get to live out our calling. We finally get to fulfill our purpose so that someday when we're gone, someone can say of us, they fulfilled God's purpose in their generation. So Jesus, we thank you for that today. So Lord, give us the courage to make changes in our life moving forward. Lord, as we, if you give us a vision of what life would look like if we lived out our calling, would you give us the courage to say yes to the things we should say yes to and no to the things we should say no to so that all of us can run in the lane you created us to run in and fulfill the purpose you've given us for our world in our generation. In Jesus' name, amen.